All right, good evening, everybody. Glad that you could uh, join us for our Wednesday night Bible study. We are walking through the book of First Peter, uh, and tonight we're going to dive back into First Peter chapter two. But before we do that, uh, we want to spend some time in prayer together. Uh, so if you will pull out your street talk, whether you got a paper copy somehow through the mail or uh, an email copy, uh, we would love for you to pull that out and just look that over. See about some of the requests that are going on uh, on our prayer list. We've been making updates as best we can. Um, we also have the birthdays and anniversaries for this month. It is, y'all, it is September. It's September already. Uh, I remember back 20 years ago, it seems, when we just started uh, doing online services in March. March, April, somewhere in there. Uh, it was just very, very interesting, uh, and it seems like, I, I don't know, it feels like it was just yesterday, and it feels like a, a year and a half has gone by just just maneuvering through all this, um, but, you know, we're blessed that God has brought us this far uh, through this year, that he's continuing to take us as we go, um, so we're just very thankful uh, for what he's done. Uh, and if you look at your street talk there, right up at the top uh, on the prayer request list, right at the top, we are almost done uh, with the repairs, remodeling, and things that need to be done uh, in the church building. Uh, so we want to thank God for everything that's been accomplished. We are still finishing up some little things, but it's been nice to walk through the sanctuary this week, know that it is very close, know that a lot of things in there are brand new. It looks very nice um, just to kind of breathe in that it's a it's a new it's a new season that's coming upon us we're really excited about that we want to give god the glory for what's going on so uh, we just are excited uh, we're very thankful i uh, just want to give you a quick announcement about our services before we go into a time of prayer um, this upcoming Sunday, this is not going to be our uh, official reopening day, uh, but this Sunday, I know we've been doing a lot of our Sunday services in the uh, youth portable for the time being, but this week we are going to do a test service in the sanctuary uh, just to make sure that all the bugs get worked out for anything requiring sound, video, uh, music, all of that. We want to be able to work through a couple of those things before we officially reopen. So we're not uh, publicizing this as everybody come on back in and fill up the building, but this upcoming Sunday we will be going from there. And then our uh, hopefully uh, grand reopening, as it were, uh, will happen uh, the Sunday after that. That's what we're uh, planning to do. So just to give you a heads up on that. Uh, so we're going to go into a time of prayer. Uh, if y'all wouldn't, wouldn't mind just grabbing uh, a name or a request off of this list that you can pray for. Uh, we have Miss Nancy, Nancy Jackson who's in hospice. So just pray for for the family there for comfort, for peace, uh, just a lot of other uh, things that are going on here. I do want to mention uh, a quick uh, extra request from myself specifically if y'all would be praying, uh, whether you've seen or heard about it or not yet. But I just had a, uh, a friend of mine uh, who lives in Tampa as a local. I, uh, we communicated a lot through uh, online gaming, things like that. I'd only gotten the chance to meet her once in person, but somebody, uh, a friend of mine who uh, we found out committed suicide on August 31st. Uh, so it's very recent. It's very uh, raw. Uh, so we just want to pray for uh, peace for their family, for comfort for them, for God to make his name known uh, amongst them. And honestly, this person has such a great impact on so many people uh, in circles of friends that I have. So I know a lot of people are dealing with this in a really, really heavy way. So if you could just be praying uh, for them. Uh, her name is Katie. I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, the the young girl who passed away. So if y'all would just be praying uh, for the family, for people involved, for friends, we'd really appreciate that. So we're going to spend a little time in prayer, thanking God for what he's done, asking him to continue to move in our lives, and that we are going to jump in to the word tonight. All right, let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for your continued provision and protection over our lives. God, you uh, are strong, you are mighty. Your hand is in all things. God, you are uh, the provider. You are the healer. Um, God, we just thank you for just being 
in our lives, being amongst us and working through every situation. God, as we think tonight about some situations that are on our prayer list this evening, God, we see situations that look bleak. We have circumstances that look difficult. We have times that look rough. Uh, and God, a lot of the times we want to question where you are, or where, uh, what, what's going on, or why things had to happen the way that they did. But God, we know that the Bible tells us that you are present at all times. You are a present in times of trouble. God, you are just with us. Uh, and God, you tell us that when we cast our care upon you, when we send up our prayers to you, when we call upon your name, God, you hear us and you take action. So Father, we call upon your name this evening. I pray that you will just be with those on the prayer list. We have people who are in the hospital with injuries, with illnesses, people who are uh, just ending, nearing the ending point of their life, Father. We have people who are uh, just sick at home or not feeling well or dealing with uh, any other kind of physical, mental, or emotional issue. I pray that you'll just be with those that are on our prayer list this evening, God, those who are close and near and dear to us. God, just allow us to realize and to remember that... Um, you hear our requests when we give them to you. And God, though the answer that we see on the surface may not look the way that we wanted it, God, we know that it's the way you want it because you've planned and purposed everything. So I pray that you'll allow us to give ourselves the grace to, to see you at work. And God, just allow us to have eyes to see you present in our lives. So we pray for uh, just this time of looking in your word, God, that you will allow us to embrace what it means to be submissive. Father, there are so many of us in here, myself included, who just want things our way, and if they're not our way to exactly the way that we like them, Father, we get upset, we get angry, we uh, lash out, we rebel. But Father, I pray that you'll help us to embrace and understand what true Christian submission is. Father, whether we are... Uh, an employee, an employer, uh, a leader, a, a servant, a helper, whether we're young or old, God, whatever position or stage of life we're in, God, help us to understand that we need to submit to you in all things and submit to what you've put in authority over us so that we can honor and glorify you. So uh, give us courage as we look through your word to have our hearts be open to hearing from you that we could change, be more like your son. And I ask all this in your name, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right into the uh, service this evening, we're just into the um, into the Bible study. So good to see y'all that are chiming in with comments. Love to see y'all here. We're going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we've been walking through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, just really excited to, to hear more about hope and what hope looks like in our lives about how we can be hopeful uh, in the circumstances and the times that we're in. And more than anything, I think now that's something that a lot of us as Christians and just as human being needs is hope, something to, to hang our hat on and allow us to know that things are going to be okay and to take action for that. So, But tonight we're going to talk about hope uh, in the middle of submission. Actually, I flipped those words on, on my official title here. We're, we're going to talk about submitting to hope submitting to hope. So tonight as we look at submitting to hope, uh, we are going to look at three motives as to why we submit to God's authority. Uh, first, uh, Peter was writing to uh, Christians that have been scattered, and in a lot of ways they are dealing with uh, persecution. They are dealing with trying to uh, navigate a new life in the midst of the gospel and in the midst of what's going on. So uh, they, they have a chance to show the world what they're made of as Christians. And Peter's encouraging believers all around the world at that time on how to do so and where their hope can come from. So uh, we're going to jump right in. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 11. We're going to start in verse 11. We're going to go through verse 25, but I'm going to read uh, just the two verses here to start off with, verses 11 and 12. In 1 Peter 2, it says this in verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
So we're looking at submitting to hope. Uh, and the reason why I kind of word it that way, submitting to hope, we want to submit to God. We want to submit to the authority that he has placed over our lives uh, as we have as we are walking through the Christian life. There are many times that, that we have different kinds of authority in our life, and it's really difficult for us to, to submit for some reason, uh, whether we just have uh, a pride issue where we want to listen to no one but ourselves, uh, whether we believe that somebody in authority over us is being mean or harsh or persecuting to us. We don't want to follow that authority. Or we really just look at authority in general and think, man, the people that are up in the high places just have no clue how to do their job, so why should I be submissive to them? Well, it all starts with submitting to the authority of God. God has given authority to other people, but first we have to look at the authority of God. Uh, God asks us to submit ourselves to specific people that are on this earth. And when we defy that, ultimately we're, we're defying the authority of God. We're denying that God's plan has a specific place in our life, that God's purpose will work out, that, uh, that what God is planning to do isn't going to work out the way that he says it. So when we rebel against authority, ultimately we're, we're rebelling against God's authority. So we really need to take that into consideration uh, as we look forward in this passage. But tonight we're going to look at three motives for submitting to God's authority, three motives that should compel us to submit to God's authority, and in turn to submit to the authority that's around us. So that first motive there is for the sake of the lost. The first motive to submit to God's authority is for the sake of the lost. Because of our submission to God, the lost are going to see us in a certain way that points their eyes to Jesus. We're only on this earth for a short time, and while we are, it's important for us to live in a godly way rather than for our own desires. Uh, right there in, in verse 11, that second part of verse 11, it says this, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So we have uh, what God wants us to do as believers, that, that uh, calling and that duty and our, that devotion in our soul, and then our fleshly desires, the things that we want to do to fulfill our deepest desires and our deepest passions. And it says that we should uh, abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against what God has for us. So these two are at a constant war with one another. So that doesn't mean that just one day we, we decide to follow God and therefore we've won the war. No, every single day is a battle in this war against the flesh. And we have to decide every day in that battle to choose to live in a godly way rather than for ourselves. And it says we're, while we're sojourners and pilgrims, so we're not on this earth. This earth is not the, the home that we should call permanent. Uh, we have a home in heaven or a home in hell that's going to be our eternal place. For the believers, our home will be in heaven. And that's who Peter's writing to here. So a lot of the time when we talk about uh, our, our final destination in eternity, when we talk about where we go when we die, Peter a lot of the time here is going to refer to heaven as being that place because he's addressing believers at this point. So he tells us that this place is not our home forever. Uh, we are going to have a home in heaven one day, but while we're here on this earth, we need to live like the way that God would want us to. And can I just tell you this? The world is always watching the Christian's behavior. They're always watching the behavior of Christians, how we act, how we react, how we respond, how we live our lives. They're looking at us and they're watching us. And really, they're looking for ways to expose us when we do wrong. They're looking for ways to say, oh, well, you call yourself a Christian, but you, um, you do this and that and the other and, you know, the, all these wrong things. Why would a Christian do that? Because in verse 12, it says this, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Now, this term Gentiles here, what the, what the meaning that Peter is saying here is anyone who's not a believer at this point. We know that many Jews and many Gentiles were saved at this point, but but. He's talking about here in the context of when non-believers look at us. <clears throat> so it says, it says, uh, your con having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers. <clears throat> so these people, 
they seek to harm you. They're looking for ways to to find the wrong in you and to expose that. The the group of people that I think about the most when I hear that phrasing is the uh, leadership in Babylon. So when Daniel was in the city of Babylon, he grew high up in the rankings of leadership there. And it's honestly because, not because he followed specifically the traditions of the Babylonians, not because uh, he did what everybody else was doing, but because he decided to obey God. He decided to submit to God's authority and to submit to the authority under him as long as he was obeying God. And it seemed that in everything that he did, the Bible says that there seemed to be no fault in him. And people were looking People were watching from around the corner. They were there at his workplace. They were listening and watching every move that Daniel made because they were just waiting for him to slip up one time so they could say, aha, I knew that you weren't perfect. I knew that you would do wrong. I knew that you were nothing but just a a slip up. And that's what people in today's world do. It's just part of the persecution of believers. It's scripture says right here, very frankly, that it's going to happen, but We're encouraged here and we're commanded here in verse 12 that our conduct should be honorable among the Gentiles. Now, we're going to see this word here, honor, a lot in these next few verses. And let me just put it up front. I'm going to remind you again. Let me put it up front what the word honorable here means. The word honorable means to highly esteem. It also means this, to have an inner respect for. So our conduct should be in such a way among non-believers that non-believers look at us and they highly esteem us based on our conduct. They have an inner respect for us based on our conduct. Now, the conduct that we have today has us labeled as bigots, has us labeled as homophobes, has us labeled as racist, has us labeled as too conservative or too liberal or whatever the case may be. And it starts with our conduct. It starts with with our actions. It starts with our thought process. It starts with our emotions. It starts with how we handle ourselves. And ultimately what it is, is how we live our lives. Are we living it like Jesus would? Are we living in such a way that reflects Christ? When a non-believer sees us doing the exact same things, whether it's right or wrong, and it's the same things that they're doing, they're going to wonder what the point of having a relationship with God is. Because they see, oh, well, my life is just like theirs. I don't need this God person that they're talking about because I'm already doing the same thing. Our testimony is going to allow for non-believers to either criticize Christ or glorify God. One of the two. So how is our testimony looking? We, We need to submit to God's authority for the sake of the lost. We need to show them what a life lived for Christ looks like. And it says at the end of this verse, here's the encouragement here. When people see us living a life that's glorifying to God... It says at the end of verse 12, that they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, visitation here can mean a couple of things. We're not really sure. Scripture isn't too clear, but there are two ways that you could look at this. That non-believers, when they see our lives, when they see our, our works, when they see the things that we do, when they come to that, that, that meeting point, that day that they come face to face with God and say, I, I want to have a relationship with you, they're going to glorify God because they remember back to when, oh, that one guy who always wears my I live for Jesus t-shirt was doing the right thing and it turned my head. It made me look and, and really think about God. And then the other way that you could work at, look at the word visitation is when people one day come to see Christ face to face before heaven. We're not really sure what the context uh, uh, leads us to believe of which one that it is, but just know that this one day when non-believers stand before God, whether they have a come to Jesus meeting in church or or just with the Holy Spirit convicting them of their sin, or one day when they stand face to face with God at the final day. They're going to remember, you know, my coworker, he always called himself a Christian. 
but we lived the exact same way. I don't see what was really different. Or, you know, that person who is my coworker or, or my friend or my neighbor, you know, there was something different about the way that they lived. And I see it now. I get it now. And they glorify God because of it. We need to submit to God's authority. Why? For the sake of the lost. Because I can tell you, if you're living for Jesus nonstop, if you are obeying him, if you're submitting to his authority, I could imagine just being in heaven one day and somebody walking up to you and say, hey, you may not know me, you may not remember me, but because of your testimony, I trusted Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? to know that because of just the way that we acted, the way that we lived out on a daily basis, caused somebody to look to Jesus and say, I need that too. We need to submit to God's authority for the sake of the lost. Now, the second motive to submit to God's authority is for the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ. Christians, we are made in the image of God. We are made in his image. So when people see us and they know that we're Christians, they know that there's going to be something different. And like I said before, they're going to look for any what reason to pin on us some kind of guilt or some kind of exposure for when we do the wrong things and say, well, you must not be like Christ because you're doing that. We are to obey God. And we're to obey, too, the laws of the world that we have in front of us. Because it's a picture of reflecting Christ. Jesus never lived on, when he lived on the earth, he never just openly defied the laws of the people around them. He submitted to God. He did what God told him to do. And then when the law said, oh, you can't do what God tells you to do, he made sure to obey God anyway, and it all worked out. But he didn't openly, physically rebel. He didn't sin. He didn't do something wrong against the people that were in front of him. Because he wanted to make sure that people knew that he was doing the right thing. And for the sake of Christ, we need to have that same attitude, that same action, because we're reflecting him. When we obey those that are in authority over us, we obey and glorify God. In verse 13 here, I'm going to read through verses 13 through 17. We're going to see uh, just what this motive uh, to submit for the sake of Christ is all about. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So here's the the big picture. God instituted government, human government. God put that together. Therefore, we ought to submit to the government that's in place over us. We ought to obey the laws that are in front of us. Now, If the government tells you to do something that strictly defies the laws of God, we need to submit to God first. And God will give us a way to be able to obey him without breaking uh, the laws of this world or or without slandering uh, the government that's around them. I go back to that example of Daniel. Daniel and his friends were in the Babylonian government. They were in the Babylonian empire. And the king of Babylon himself ordered... Daniel and the young men to to eat a certain portion of food or or to to eat in the ways that they ate. And Daniel didn't just openly rebel and say, oh, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do my own thing and and ask that the government be defunded over there and defy what they're doing and riot and all of that and protest. No, he actually went to a government authority and said, hey, I know that this is your ordinance and this is your law and I respect that. But According to the rules and laws that I follow with God, could we try doing this instead and see how it turns out? He didn't try to backstab any authority. He didn't try to slander anybody. He made peace with men and trusted in God, and God allowed it to work out. I can only imagine if Christians were to trust God in the face of the government, how God would work 
so that we could still be in obedience to him and be at peace with officiating authorities over us. Because here's the thing, disobeying authority gives non-believers the perfect opportunity to slander God. Disobeying authority gives non-believers a right to be able to say, you know, your God must not be all that great if in order to obey him, you have to disobey the other authorities that are around you. God gives us the freedom as Christians to be able to obey and live in this world without making a ruckus. It says here in, in verse 16, it says, we are free. As Christians, we are free. And in verse 16, it says, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. As Christians, we shouldn't use our freedom in Christ as some kind of facade to be able to uh, go over top of someone else's head or, or to undermine someone else's authority. That's not what God would have wanted us to do. That's not how God wanted things to happen. Now, we look at the world's government today, and can I tell you, we're just in a crazy time. We have an election coming up soon. We have uh, people uh, underneath in different forms of government too below, and it is just a madhouse. And I'm not going to get overly political tonight. I'm not going to do or say or endorse anything, but let me just make this clear, y'all. As Christians, we need to obey what God says. We need to obey what God says. We need to look into his word and discern what is right and what is wrong and do the right and shun the wrong. There's a lot of times where uh, we, we look for uh, ways to, to be able to take action and we take that call to action as, oh, well, if I don't do the wrong thing, then I'm doing the right thing. That's not the way that it works, you know. It says here in the, in the passage that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And just before that, it says that there are those in authority who are sent to punish evil and reward good. So as a Christian, you may sit back and say, you know, as long as I don't do anything wrong, as long as I don't vote for the wrong thing, as long as I don't speak out against the wrong thing, as long as I'm not associated with the wrong thing, then I'm good. But God calls us to act to do the right thing, not just sit back and not do the wrong thing. If we sat back as Christians and didn't sin, but never did anything for God, what are we accomplishing for his kingdom as we move forward? God calls us to do the right and shun the wrong. Uh, when, when God described Job to Satan, he said, one that fears God and shuns evil. Are you doing both, church? Are you doing one and not the other? Are you doing the wrong and not doing the right? God gives us a call to act correctly and to shun what's wrong. And we see this word here again, honor. In verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and then it says again, honor the king. Honor means to highly esteem and to have an inner respect for. We need to have a respect for the people in authority over us. There may be candidates running for a certain political office or for a certain government office right now that could potentially be an authority over us. And you may think in your own mind and in your own heart that that person's a joke, that that person has no idea what they're doing, that that person is not right for that office. Guess what? God put them there. And if we're going to backslide and slander the people that are running for office, if we're going to uh, call out the wrongdoings of all the people behind their backs uh, uh, that are going for some sort of potential office, and we're not being submissive, Guess what? We're not submitting to God's authority. Okay? So calling out uh, a certain party for doing this wrong or calling out a certain person for, for being a screw-up or a joke or not being what's right for this country, you need to stop saying God doesn't know what he's doing because essentially that's what you're saying. And I know that's harsh, but let's be real. God knows what he's doing. So whoever takes that office come November, whoever takes all the smaller offices in the future as we move forward and as we vote, God knows what he's doing. 
So let's not call God out and say that he doesn't know what he's doing by saying that, we, oh, well, I don't think that person should be there. Or, oh, I don't think that person is right for this office. Let God do what God's doing. And when you submit to God's authority, you're going to start submitting to the authorities around you. And submitting to God's authority is for the sake of Christ. Just think of the mud that we throw in his name every day when we're in the workplace by, by being complacent or by even doing things wrong. We need to submit to God's authority for the sake of Christ. The third motive we should have for submitting to God's authority coming out of verses 18 through 25 is this, for our own sake. We need to submit to God's authority for our own sake. Now, I'm going to talk to the working class here. I'm going to talk to the people that have the nine to fives. I'm going to talk about the people that are small business owners. I'm going to talk to the people that are entrepreneurs. I'm going to talk to uh, the people who, who have somebody in authority over them or are in authority over other people. In verse 18, it says this, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Let me just stop right there. What Peter just said here, what God is telling us here, is that we need to be submissive to those in authority over us, the good and the bad, and the ugly. If we're not willing to do that, we're not submitting to God's authority, and we need to do a a quick check on life. It says this, For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongly. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Now let me break down this passage just a little bit before we go further. You see somebody uh, come in late to work. And they're the, the boss, the manager, the whoever gets on to that person who's late for work and says, you know, you, you need to be on time more often. You're never punctual. You're never this. You're never that. You know, and that person just takes it and they're, yeah, whatever. I don't care. I'm going to come in late again the next day anyway. The Bible says, what does it matter? That it's just wrong and wrong, bashing heads, and it's not doing anything. But if you are somebody who is constantly doing the right thing, you're punctual, you are Uh, doing things that the way that you're being asked to, you have a great work ethic. You're just that smile that that people get around the office because you're just that person, you know, that just brings life and encouragement to the place. But then for some reason, in the midst of doing the right thing, doing the best that you can, you get that talking to or you get yelled at or you get slandered by uh, your boss or your manager or somebody who is in authority or somebody who's even just around you. The Bible says when we take it patiently, when we're doing the right thing, it says it is commendable of God. So when we suffer while doing the right things, guess what? God's going to talk about it. It says it's commendable by God commendable. That means it's, it's kind of like a, whenever you have a job application, right? You get that job application, you put on all your experience, all your work stuff that you've done in the past, your resume, everything that's on there. And then you get that little section that says references. I wonder on your spiritual resume, if you want to put down God as a reference, because you know what he'd have to say about you. The Bible says when we suffer while doing the right thing, that would be, God would be the person to put down on our reference list because he'd want to talk about you. Just like he talked about Job. He said, hey, hey, Satan, have you seen my servant Job over here? Satan didn't ask. Satan didn't want to know. Satan didn't care. It says that he was frolicking to and fro in the desert doing his own thing. But God points out his servant and says, you see that man over there? That is somebody who fears God and shuns evil. And despite all the horrible things that happened to Job later in that book, God still points out and says, guess what? There's my servant Job who does right and shuns wrong. Even when his family's been taken away, his possessions have been taken away, he's been slandered, he's been hurt, he's been physically injured. It's a man who still fears me. What a testimony. What a testimony. Can I tell you this? Submission means obedience to authority even when we are reviled 
by our authority. If you look here further in this passage as we go, going into verse 21, it says this, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. When Jesus was reviled, when Jesus was persecuted, when Jesus was beaten and hurt, did he retaliate? No. He accepted what was going on. He still did the right thing. Christian, if you're listening, hear, hear this. When someone has done you wrong, retaliating will do nothing. But enduring with perseverance will prove your character. Retaliating will do absolutely nothing. It, it will just hurt the cause. It'll hurt what's going on. And we need to reflect the image of Christ when we submit to people. And what Christ did was, it says no deceit was found in his mouth. There was no evil that came from him. He submitted. His life and his death were submission. We can do the same thing. We can reflect the image of Christ by submitting. This is going to grow us. This is going to teach us. This is going to help us. At the end of verse 25, I'm sorry, going 24, it says, Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Because of seeing Jesus be that witness on the cross for us, we have the perfect picture of how we need to act, of how we need to live. And we grow by it. We grow in righteousness. Righteousness is, is not the standard that people have for you. It's not the standard that humans have for you. It's the standard that God has and that God sees you by. And you grow closer to righteousness when you submit like Christ did. Submitting to God's authority is for our own sake too. God doesn't just say, hey, I want you to obey authority because it's not going to do you any good, but you know what? You have to anyway. No, God instituted government. He instituted authority. He instituted people to be over us so that we can understand what it means to submit. If we can't submit to people here on earth, if we can't receive a ticket from a police officer without yelling at him or screaming at him or getting frustrated or upset at him or saying mean things to him, how in the world are we going to submit to God when he calls us out on sin? How in the world are we going to hear the Holy Spirit when he convicts us of something that we've done wrong? Because God's going to be a lot more graceful than human authority. Let's be real. God's going to have a lot more mercy on you than human authority will. But God is also holy. God is also just. God also requires us to obey. So submitting to God's authority, it's not just something you ought to do. There's, we have motivation to do so. It's for the sake of the lost. When we submit to God's authority and the authority underneath us, we're showing a picture of Jesus to the lost that could in turn convict them and allow them to be saved as well. The second motivation to submit to God's authority and to those around us is for the sake of Christ. We need to reflect the image of God to other people so that his name cannot be run through the mud. We must live in such a way so that there is no opportunity for anyone to slander the name of God. And that's, that is relevant and that is evident in all the things that we do. The things that we do uh, in our workplace, out in public, with our family and friends, at home behind closed doors. The things that we do, we ought to live in such a way that the Bible would call above reproach so that no one should have opportunity to slander God's name. And the last motivation, it's for our own sake. This is for our personal growth, people. If we're not willing to submit to authority, we're never going to grow. We're, we're never going to uh, see our relationship with God progress because we are rebelling against his authority to begin with. 
God calls us to more. God calls us to submit to his authority. And when we do, we're going to catch more of a glimpse of that hope that he's called us to because he's going to grow us. Will we see some persecution? Yes, but if we take it patiently and continue to submit to God, we're going to grow in righteousness. We're going to grow closer to God. We have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And we can find that hope more when we submit to it, when we submit to Jesus Christ. Now, this, this word here, submit, okay? We think of the word submit, and the first thing we think of is, oh, it's, it's like slavery. It's like being in bondage to something. No, submission is just simple obedience to something that's going to be helpful to you in the, in the long run. Submission is, in a Christian sense, doing what is right, knowing that when you do it, in the long run, it's going to be more helpful for you. That's why brand new Christians who were slaves at the time in biblical times, they, the Christians would try and run away from their masters. We saw that in the book of Philemon. But Paul tells uh, this slave, hey, you need to actually go back and finish serving your time and be submissive, be obedient, because God is going to grow you. God is going to reward you through that. Now, while we don't have slaves like, th- like they did back then, like we do today, God still calls us as employees. God still calls us as employers. God still calls us as people who are uh, uh, voting citizens, as, as people who are living in this earth. God calls us to submit, to obey. When we submit to God's authority, it's going to be easier to, su- to submit to the authority around us. And when we submit to God's authority, when the authority that's on this earth wants to do us wrong and tell us to not do what God tells us to do, God's going to give us the answer. So we need to submit to his authority no matter what. Let's pray tonight. God, I just thank you that your authority reigns supreme. God, your authority is over all. And God, the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. God, I think of... I think of a, of a lyric from a rap song where, where somebody uh, says that even Trump will have to take a knee before God. <laughs> it's just, it's funny for me to think, but we think about it. People who are in the highest positions of authority in the world, to, to people who are in poverty, to everywhere in between, every person on this earth, no matter who we are, no matter how great we think that we are, the Bible says that we will bow. So God, as Christians, while we're on this earth, help us to bow the knee right now. Help us to bow the knee and to submit to you so that other people can see us and see Jesus Christ in us through that. God, I pray that you will help us to set aside our political differences, help us to set aside the petty things that are around us, and God, just help us to obey. Help us to submit. God, I know that there are people uh, in, in, in my own church and, and in churches across this nation who, who would rather stubbornly do the things that they want to do instead of listen to what you have for them because what you have for them to do doesn't seem to be the thing that they want to do. God, help us to abstain from those fleshly lusts that we would obey you instead because you call us to righteousness. You call us to live that life. God, I pray that you would just give us the strength. Give us courage in the midst of people who just want to slander and beat us down. Father, help us to submit to you this evening, this next day, every day for the rest of our lives. And I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for being here this evening. Uh, I really do appreciate it. I know it has been uh, difficult uh, to, you know, kind of continue to do this. Um, after we start our first in-person Sunday service, we will be returning as well to our Wednesday night services. So it's not going to be this upcoming week, but very soon we will go back to uh, services in the buildings on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights. We're going to continue in this study until it's done. Uh, but I just thank you so much for being here. Keep praying as uh, things are being done at the church. We really just want to pray a blessing over the church as we come to this time of reopening that God would just renew the desire of our hearts to to work for the glory of his kingdom, to, to reach out in those in our communities, to bring them to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would just convict us 
and in turn convict those that we come in contact with. Uh, just be praying for that as we move forward. I'm so excited to see what's going to come up soon, and I just, I just can't wait for what God has for us moving forward. So I pray that y'all have a great night. We love you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you again for our live stream on Sunday morning. Y'all have a great night. All right. God bless you. We'll see you soon.